young like us jump from box car to box car. We have nothing but the beauty of what we are. From 7,000 islands to this one, we collide and connect, speaking different dialects. Our humor strong, our resolve even stronger. We'll sow the seeds to harvest all the food that we need. an ongoing project for a couple years, and I'd love to know where it started. What was the first seed of any one of you all coming together with this idea? So, um, I think we were doing Allegiance, right? Uh, I think it was the, uh, the Bay Area premiere. That was like t four years ago? It was 2018, I feel like. I think um, Apple just reminded me, like, hey, memories, right here. Uh, a few days ago, but um, yeah, we were in the backstage, you know, getting ready, uh, warming up, and we all like looked around and were like, wow, there's a lot of Filipinos playing Japanese people. Um, don't we have any of our own stories to like to tell, right? And, around, and, and then um, around that time too, um, Gail Romasanta and the late and great Don, Dr. Don Mabalan wrote this book uh, called Journey for Justice. And, you know, I, I, we read it. Um, yes. Um, and, and then it clicked. And I was working, I, I'm st I was working at, uh, I'm still working at, uh, at Bravo around that time. And there was, uh, we were doing Cesar Chavez's um, uh, own musical. And there was one line in there that said, the Filipinos are already doing it. And so as a Filipino, that got me all like, okay. Sure, you know, I'm learning, I'm working, and then that was it. That was the only time that, you know, the Filipinos were ever brought up again. And so, and then it was, it was just serendipitous that Gail and, and Don like wrote that book and it was just history finding you, you know? And then that's when I was like, Brian, Gail, we should, uh, we should write something, you know? And also because of the fact that they are also, we all came from Bindlestiff. And so we've been working also, you know, with each other, with, you know, for a few years now. And so it was just like, it was meant to be. And so we then went to a wine bar. <laughs> and yeah, we, we, I, propo you know, I proposed the, uh, the, the idea to them and they were like, yeah, absolutely. You know, it, I think it's time that, that something is written about us that we can perform on stage. And I think that was, that was a lot more, uh, more than anything. But also like just this whole entire process of like, of learning your own history, right? And so that, that was more important and, and, and fulfilling. Right, right, yes, please. Oh. I was just transitioning the mic over, but, um, <laughs> but shout out to Mel and Brava Theater for believing in us from the very beginning. <laughs> because, you know, Gail and I, when we started writing the music during the pandemic, we were like, we felt alone for a lot of the times. And so um, Brava really saw us and gave us the opportunity to be able to present on the stage. And so I think that gave us really the encouragement and the, um, inspiration to, to keep going because we have a space and we have that support. So, um, but yeah, it, that's, uh, so we're really grateful. Thank you for having us, by the way, CAMFest. We are all so excited to be here and thank you everybody for sharing this milestone for us. I can definitely say when we began, we very much felt alone, not just because it was during the pandemic, um, but when they said that they were in Allegiance, they really were in Allegiance. Um, Brian, Mara, who you're gonna see later on, and Melvin, they both were Allegiant, it, were in the um, West Coast premiere of Allegiance um, at the Palo Alto Theater. <clears throat> oh, excuse me, Contra Costa Theater. And then um, Chris also was in Allegiance later on, a few years later, and so was Mara again. And so uh, many of those same actors and actresses were Filipino. 
And so it really started with being inspired by allegiance, being inspired by the book. So, I mean, you're definitely looking at kind of like an interconnectedness, right, with what inspires us and what inspires artists. So you've got allegiance going on. You've got George Decay telling his story, right? He also has books. Um, you have the passing of Assembly Bill uh, 7 and Assembly Bill 123, which was by uh, former Attorney General Rob Bonta, who was an assembly, <coughs> I mean, I'm sorry, former Assembly Member Rob Bonta, who is now our Attorney General, who passed all that policy to lead the way for us telling um, California public school students, K through 12, uh, about Larry Itliong and the Filipino farm workers who were a part of it. And so it was really a convergence. And that famous um, book, if any of you are literature majors, everything that converges must rise. And so I believe that we all completely came together um, to really rise together and tell this story. And a neat thing, Chris probably won't say, but he was actually one of our first demos. He also <laughs> is very much a musical theater artist as well, not just an amazing cinematographer, um, but he also sang one of our first demos um, that we shared with folks who were really close to us because we actually kept this a secret for a year, the first two years, and we didn't really tell anybody. We weren't sure where we were going with it, and at some times it was so hard, we actually wondered, at least I know in conversations with Brian, we were like, we have no money. This is going to take an, an incredible, intense amount of money. How do you keep on going? And we kept on going, and really, honestly, the community really, really buoyed us and to where we are today. You can yes and that, Chris. That's... Oh, oh. Yes, <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. And forgive me, um, trying to rewind my memory. Allegiance at Contra Costa was 2018, 2019. Great. So it's been, oh, can I do math? Six years, five years since that very first wine bar conversation about the seedlings of this production. And of course, the pandemic happened. So uh, were you all able to stay connected and sink your teeth into this during that time? Did you like feel like you needed to put a pause before you could move forward? Um, and so give me like a little bit of a timeline for like what this development process was like. We actually started and we had this wonderful idea in March 2020 that we were going to kick this off. It was like the first week of March, we made our first song, we created our uh -huh. first song, we uh -huh. recorded it, and then March 11th on my birthday happened and that was the, no. the announcement of the pandemic. And so this actually was really good because that was all that we focused on other than whatever else was going on in our lives and also kind of a fearful time. Um, and so, I know for myself, I don't know anybody here, uh, but we also brought in Chris, not just, first we thought, okay, he's gonna do the demo. And then we brought him in during, um, uh, you know, when we, when we figured that we were gonna go ahead and do a Zoom reading, but I'll let Chris explain that. And I think that actually birthed something different and it birthed two mediums that Larry, the musical, could possibly go. Thanks, Gail. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we became friends through artistic endeavors, if you will, just musical theater in general. And um, who remembers during the pandemic Zoomsicles? You know what Zoomsicles are? Yes, I do. Yeah, people yes, were doing, we were, man, we were entertaining ourselves. <laughs> we were doing everything to entertain ourselves over Zoom, right? So there came a point where people were doing full on musical productions on Zoom, right? Um, there was a point where I think my wife had, a, there was like some event that her work held where there were um, drag queens in Brazil doing a, a special performance. And this is the kind of atmosphere we were living in, right? So I think towards the, the tail end of like, the, at the beginning, Zoom was very fresh and people wanted that kind of content. And so I think that's why like our friends here were, were saying, let's go ahead and, and just share our songs over Zoom. But towards the tail end of that, I knew that that wasn't gonna last very long, so I just kind of presented an idea. I, my, my creative juices were like, I wanted something to do, right? Um, so I, I said, hey, maybe not Zoom. <laughs> We've got maybe another idea if, if you'll entertain me. And then I pitched this idea, because you know, my wife, she's a, she's a performer, she's a, you know, 
She's a performance artist, she's a vocalist. And she was basically my muse during that pandemic time. I just shot a lot of like music videos with her at home with our dog. Uh, and I said, I was just sharpening my, my skills there and I said, maybe we can bring that level of artistry or more to this project. Because I feel like if we film it in a, in a way that's not over your computer camera, then maybe, maybe it's got legs, maybe it can go a little bit further, right? So that's kind of like how that started. And they, thank you for going with the idea, I think. <laughs> We're like, let's just go for it and see what happens. So. Hell yeah. I mean, um, I just want to shout out that this whole story, like a lot of the ways that artists have had to build resilience and find ways to continue to build community over Zoom, other mediums during the pandemic, I feel like uh, there's a silver lining there in terms of like knowing where you sit in collaboration, uh, creating stories, and then coming back with a really big oomph like now that we're back together in real physical time and place. Um, I do want to shift us, we have a video from Billy. Yeah, should we tee up who Billy is? And yes, then maybe yes we can, please. Yeah. Gail, Brian, do you want to talk about Billy? All right, Billy is my, he's my, um, he's my co-collaborator, my brother from another mother. He is a brilliant artist. Um, uh, he's our director and choreographer for Larry the Musical. And, uh, he was not able to be here. He'll explain why in this video. Um, but there's a couple things that you're going to see in this video. You're going to see a little tee up from Billy explaining why he's not here and all these things. But um, also he's going to give a little, um, he's, this video will show a little bit about the process that we went through to create this thing in, in round one of what we did for workshop one. But I do want to say this about Billy. When they approached this subject about bringing on this uh, director, Broadway director, they're like, he's highly collaborative. Sorry, Billy, I know you're gonna watch this later. I gotta tell this story. <laughs> he's highly collaborative. And my, my gut reaction was like, oh, is he? <laughs> oh, is he? Because most people who say they're collaborative, I mean, raise your hand if you've ever done a group project before. And you know what I mean? I'm collaborative. No, you're not really. But the thing is, Billy is super collaborative. He's an amazing person. And, and you're definitely gonna feel that with this video. Hello everyone, my name is Billy Bustamante. I am the director and choreographer of Larry, A New Musical. I am so thrilled to be a part of the first musical to ever be included in CamFest. I'm sending you all my love from the East Coast where I'm currently in rehearsals for Here Lies Love on Broadway. Rest assured though, my heart is in San Francisco with all of you, especially my Larry fam who is in the house tonight. Hi, Larry fam. Love y'all, miss y'all. Let's eat soon. Working on Larry the Musical has been the most joyful and the most meaningful artistic experience of my life. I have never been a part of a theater project that is also a community building project. The idea that we set out to create a piece of theater, a piece of art that is for, by, and about our community um, is something that I've never been able to experience before. This video that you're about to see is a glimpse of our first workshop where we were first beginning to put material on its feet. And now we are three workshops in, several rewrites in, a full draft of a full musical in, and we are so excited about the progress that's been made and the progress that is yet to come. We, again, are building a story and an experience for our community, for you, and we are so excited to open our doors and welcome you in. And with that, I hope that you can do whatever you can to help us get there. We, ab we absolutely need support from you, and we hope that you will join us, join the movement, and join Larry. With that said, I think the only thing left to do is roll the tape. I'm sending you all so much love. Salamat. Take care. There are so many special aspects about Larry's story uh, that drew me to this project and to this piece. The moment I met Gail and Brian, I knew that they were a really special team, and I knew that they were on to something incredibly special, not just special, but incredibly necessary, incredibly valuable in terms of the types of stories that the world needs to hear in this moment. From day one, this room, whether it was on a Zoom room or in live space, was filled with purpose-driven artists. The thing that gets me most excited is that in my 20 years 
of being a professional theater artist, this is the first time I can say that I am part of an all Filipino American project. Every single person touching this project is of Filipino American descent. And to be able to be a part of a piece that is not just for us, but also by us and about us is something I have never been able to, to experience before. And to speak, to give folks a little behind the scenes glimpse of what that looks like in a room, you know, we've spent four days together. And I guess over the course of those four days, we've spent 20 hours bringing this story to life. And every hour that passes comes with tears, laughter, hugs, connection, discoveries, life-affirming lessons in a way that I've never experienced in a theatrical process before. And I think that's the special and new thing that this entire room is feeling. That is the effect of being in a room that is for, by, and about you. I'm not finding my mark. <laughs> find your light. Find, your light. find my mark. Find your light, theater people. Oh, it's okay, the light will find you. <laughs> Beautiful. Ah. Oh. I feel like for me, I'm trying to recenter myself because it may be a little emotional to hear straight from Billy, you know, how special and how much love went into this collaborative project. Um, just really being able to sit in the origins of, you know, seeing and being Filipino American artists and not playing Filipino American people on stage. There, I, I feel like in my time as a director and retired performer, um, there were, it's still so early to find roles that are grounded in Filipino stories for our community, especially such a rich one like here in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's lit out here. We have so many pop and talented artists and to be able to offer this story in particular to our community of artists, but also like, dive into the history that we have here as Filipino Americans. It's really, really special. So thank you for all for this. No, I, I just, um, that means so much to us. And I just want to give a shout out to all the, the Bay Area folks, San Francisco artists, Filipino artists out there. Like, Bind uh, and Gail mentioned this earlier, but Bindlestiff, you know, was a part of the three of us, uh, you know, our development as artists, and like Bindlestiff fam is out there, and you're doing the thing, right? Like we're all telling our stories, and the, and the, the fact that we're able to, to God, see, I'm getting emotional. The fact that we're able to do, to do this and tell our own stories is really powerful, um, and I feel so honored. Like I don't, we, I think all of us don't take this experience and, and this creation of this work lightly. I think that's why when Billy said, you know, every day we met, we were crying, literally crying. <laughs> we're gonna cry later over drinks. But, um, <laughs> but it is very special. And when you were asking about the development process, I think you saw there, we were doing a lot over Zoom. Like we, wrote a, we wrote a lot. Gail, Gail and Kevin Kamia, who couldn't be here, are um, a, a other writer. And uh, Sean Kana, shout out to Sean Kana, the music director and my co-composer. <laughs> Like, we were all doing the thing over Zoom and just doing it in our, uh, writing in our homes. Um, so that was a silver lining, right? Because we were able to, um, we had that uh, way to, to collaborate um, over Zoom and over technology, right? So anyway, I, it's very, very special for all of us. And I wanna say this for all artists out there also, when we talk about the developmental process, I think, when artists are growing, and they're growing in community, and they're growing together, it is so important to have space. Um, so this marks actually 20 years. Um, in 2003, CAM, which was NATA, uh, which was formerly NATA, um, actually featured my short film in one of their, in their shorts program, and I was a grad student, and I was in my 20s, and I was at Bindlestiff as well. I had been at Bindlestiff since I was an undergrad um, when we used to just pay $600 rent and pay the utilities and it was really punk rock on 6th Street. Um, it still is a little bit punk rock on 6th Street. And um, you know, it is very much experiences like this and milestones like this 
that we can all create because at some point in our lives we were absolutely supported by community. I mean, that milestone in CamFest, they said, hey, you're a filmmaker, I'm gonna put you in here, you're a writer, you're a director, you're doing all these things. Um, and I never felt like I had a place because I played music, I actually co-composed on that first film. I, I didn't know where I fit in and the only place I really fit in was on 6th Street on Bindlestiff. And it wasn't until another organization like CAM Nata before said, hey, you're an artist. And then you begin to grow and you begin to identify and see yourself and you validate your own experience. And so for those of you who are thinking about writing, who are thinking about your own developmental process, you came here to figure out how the blueprint for how to create and continue creating, sustaining. I want to say that I have four kids. And the fact that I was this, this experience 20 years ago, 25 years, 25 years ago, absolutely normalized my perspective and my view that I was and always will be an artist and I've never stopped since. So I wanna say thank you. Thank you to all the mothers out there and all of our nurturers because you are all mothers and nurturers of community, all of you women, and thank you for even being here on Mother's Day when everybody who nurtures their community, regardless if they have children or not, who inspire and are muses, I think that is the real through, through line of our communities, really is, is mother um, and also um, um, matriarchal society for the, the Philippines. That was our original before we became yes. colonized. Yes. So I wanna say in developmental phases for all of you, and in development, find your place and find where you will become validated as an artist. It is only in that validation and working for years and years, I can say that all of us, this isn't something that we thought of last week. We've all been sitting and training, training like we were gonna go into artistic Olympics some years. Mm -hmm. And we never knew if we were gonna get it right. We never knew if we actually were going to succeed. And we did it anyway. And so you need to find those circles and those spaces that absolutely normalize the perspective that you are worth it and you are telling your story and people should listen. And so I wanna talk about that in the development. You need those spaces and you need these places and organizations to really, really be able to cl clearly see your vision so that it's absolutely clear, right? Absolutely clear and you can see it and you, you have an amazing, like I, I, I'm so grateful every day that I get to work with everyone here. I mean, they are just rock stars on their own, but I mean, I'm talking on the, you know, we're on Zoom with Billy, Billy's like, <laughs> Billy's in, um, and I don't know if all, if all of you are familiar with Here Lies Love, but David Byrne, and Fat Boy Slim work together on it, and it's going to be, um, it's going to be on Broadway this summer. And, and to find have that caliber where everyone is firing all the time and really at the at the top of, of where they are and leveling up, which I got from Chris. That's his word. We gotta level up. Has been really really inspiring to me, but has really kind of shined my lenses to see what else in this new stage for myself as a woman, like in this new phase of my life, like, oh, I can see better now. And I'm surrounded by these folks who help me see. And so that is so important when we talk about process. Thank you so much for that, Gail. I mean, yes, just plus wanting all of that in terms of Create, creating circles, creative or not, where you can see yourself reflected, but also see yourself echoed back in terms of creating yourself and your experience. I feel like a beautiful thing about projects like Larry, like Here Lies Love, is that we're finally in a place where we can soak in that even the Filipino-American experience is not a monolith. There are so many rich stories out there to be told, and we're not limited by history even. We're limited, uh, not unlimited in terms of like the way we see ourselves in, in the stories. Um, speaking of that, I wanted to ask a little bit about the development process and kind of like the, um, you did a public, two public performances, yes? One of which was uh, uh, filmed in the video we just saw with Billy. Um, and yeah, I wanted to ask about what that's been like in terms of 
creating community now that we're finally back in person and also offering it up to the community. <laughs> oh man, okay. Well, I'm like, let's go. Talking, let's I'm go. Talking about this. <laughs> so, um, man, I, I'm trying to think ahead. We're going to show another video soon enough, and I don't want to spoil some of that stuff. So, I'm like editing in my brain right now. Always editing. Um, so, this process has been really interesting because we actually had one semi public performance. No, two. You're right. It was two. See? Editing. Um, the most recent one was at Brava. We had a small group of invited guests and, uh, to come through, many of whom were from FONS, which is the Filipino American National Historical Society. Um, some friends from Delano. Any Delano, Delano folks in the house today? And Delano, let's go. That's right. Delano, where much of the historical story took place. Um, so they were present for that reading. But we also, in Working backwards, that was workshop three. Working backwards to workshop two, we went. We actually went to Delano, and we performed for the community in Delano, um, and it was hot. I mean, <laughs> fam, it was hot. Okay, that like, was in August, right? We so okay. And then let me let me go back to workshop one. Workshop one, we heard from the grapevine that our friends at Delano had taken it. They, they were like that was really great. Those folks on the screen, though, they look like they've never picked a grape in their life. You know? And so we're like, time to build bridges, baby. And so um, we started building these bridges. Uh, Mel, who was with me, we went on like a couple of scouts to go down and, and also just connect with the community. Gail, been there so many times. Brian, and we just started building friendships over time. And then we, in workshop two, that's when we actually performed these uh, a number of songs for the Delano community. And um, it was beautiful. Uh, it was just a, a really beautiful, you know, hot, Time, you know, um, and we got our friends in the fields. They touched the grapes. I don't know. I can't say they picked the grapes. I don't know if it was legal or not, but you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, no. Uh, the the fact that we got to go to the places that we're singing about and actually interact with the people who are, whose story we're telling, and and I think I can say this: get their blessing as well to to show that we were actually. Listen, we're not a bunch of like suits. We're not corporate anybody coming in and trying to take a story from people. We're really trying to partner with people who live this thing so that we get it right. And I think that's what makes this whole thing unique about telling a Filipino-American story, our story, coming from the, the hands that are creating it are the brown hands. And we have inherited that work and that legacy from the hands that tilled this field. I, I can't tell you that like how, how meaningful it was to even like make that drive. If you've driven down to like like through Tejon, anyone like get up to Tejon and like try try to drive down to LA, it takes a different like meaning when I like drive down there. Because I know that like our ancestors went up and down that those fields and made that work happen, you know? So I don't know. I think I meandered there, but hopefully I answered that question. Oh, that's beautiful. I feel yeah. like the um, that says to me that not only does Larry tell the history of our, our peoples and our communities, our ancestors in that area and in that space and time, but it's also talking about our present. It's so grounded in like who, who is still working those fields and that the story is for them as well. I wanted to add to that. It's great that you said like the, uh, you know, the, uh, the connection, right? It's because also like when we were doing our, um, our uh, research, uh, I think it was after the first workshop. We're like, all right, so what are we gonna do for the second workshop? Mind you, this is all happening during COVID. Yeah, like singing and, and we couldn't even do this. Like, yeah, it, it, was, it was super, yeah. I mean, if it was, if there was like the hardest thing, it was like trying to produce something during COVID with everyone being there, obviously, right? Because you, we didn't want to do the Zoom um, um, aspect of it. But going back to, to what y'all were talking about earlier, like meeting these folks, one of the things that really stuck to me was that interviewing them and just listening to their stories, right, about like when they were younger, and we think of manongs and manangs and they're old, right? But when you start hearing them tell about like their experiences, you, they go back into that time of when they were younger and you're, it's, it's, it's moving in a way because they were young ones, right? 
in, in the story that we're telling uh, for Larry or in, in the musical, we're not telling them as old people. We are telling them as at our age, pretty much, you know? Yeah, you know what I mean? Now look at us. But, <laughs> you know, hopefully someone tells our story later on. But, but for us, <laughs> it's, I think that's more of a, uh, a gem for me that I was able to take away from because of the fact that I think Gail was the one that said, like, we have to take it to the folks that would only take their stories but not bring it back to them and show them. And so it was really important that we did, uh, you know, we made the trek down there to not come once, twice, but like three or four times, you know, and, and actually present the work that we are creating so that they can see themselves in these characters. And I think that happens a lot in marginalized communities. So if you're ever gonna be writing or you're going to showcase or film marginalized communities and our histories, you have to understand people go in there and they take the stories and they leave everybody behind as if, as if real people aren't still there. Um, you know, and like people talk about Delano all the time, but Delano is real. People are still alive and people were still alive and they were there when their parents voted to march on September 7th, 1965. For those of you who came in here and you're like, but wait a minute, what is this story about, right? What is this, what is Larry the Musical about? So I'll try to do it very, very quickly. Larry Itliang, he was, he co-founded, we like to say that he co-founded the UFW with Cesar Chavez and with many brothers and sisters of the movement. Um, Co-founded the United Farm Workers. Short story, of, uh, short history. Filipino Americans had been farming the land, right, since the early 1900s. There were migrant farm workers moving up and down um, California and the West Coast. Larry Itlion comes in 1929. 19, um, 19, uh, 1930 and 1929, Watsonville happens. How many of you know Watsonville, the Watsonville riots? There you go, Watsonville riots. 500 white men decided to run Filipinos out of Watsonville near Santa Cruz and um, murdered someone and nobody, murdered a Filipino, a young Filipino man, and nobody, nobody got arrested. Also, 1930, that same week, after New Year's, the Stockton Filipino um, Federation of America building was bombed by the KKK. Um, there was a resurgence during this time of the KKK. Up and down the West Coast, you are seeing Filipinos getting lynched. And these are not just every, like, oh, these are two instances. That's it. No, it was on a daily occurrence that for fun, the Manongs, the older generation who lived through these times would joke and say, um, that it was a pastime to beat Filipinos up, and that is absolutely the truth. Um, they were getting lynched, um, they were getting run out of town. If you left the Chinatown, if you left Little Manila, you would get beat up. Um, so a number of things were happening, but also the union movement was happening, social movements. Filipinos, because they had nothing to lose, most of them were young. Can you imagine a Filipino-American community without elders? That's what we had, right? When Larry came in here, he came into a Filipino community, in the United States that had no elders. So it's basically everybody here and you're 15 through 21. Can you imagine you're working the fields and someone said, nope, I'm not gonna raise you 10 cents. You'd be like, oh no, let's talk. And that's how the Filipino community was. They were hardcore, like they were super absolutely militant. And if you mess with them during the day, and this is Dr. Don Mabalon, and we would laugh because we were raised by monos. We were raised by those farm workers. My family and my mother's side were farm workers when they came here to the United States. And we would laugh because they were hard. They were hardcore. They always had a knife in their pocket. And so this story is about how hard, but how loving and how funny and how joyful that community was that raised Larry Itliang so that he became a leader um, of the farm labor movement and the labor movement um, in the United States and called um, when the Filipinos decided to go on grape strike. No one had ever organized grapes before, um, but Filipinos decided to organize grape strikes in the South, right? You've got Coachella first. So they went to Coachella first, did the grape strikes down there, and they won, and they decided to go up to Delano, and then they voted to go on strike. The great Delano grape strike happened. One week later, Larry calls Cesar Chavez and says, hey, if you go on strike neck, we're, we're gonna break your strike, so you better join us on our strike. And so Larry, was friends with Dolores already because they had worked previously together in other union organizing endeavors. So um, Caesar and Dolores, they went and they had a vote with the Mexican American community. They came together and they said, we're with you. And that was the birth of solidarity that no one had ever known before. 
okay? And so when we're talking about first time being in solidarity with another marginalized community, can, I mean, all of you, I know many of you are community organizers here. You know how hard community organizing is now post George Floyd? Can you imagine community organizing back then when growers actually, um, they, they would, they would on purpose make sure that none of the migrants, none of the migrants were friends so that they gave everybody a different wage so they would always disrupt the working class, the migrant labor class so they never liked each other and they'd give it by ethnicity. Um, and so if you can imagine that and finally becoming in solidarity and what happens, and what happens to leaders like Larry Itleon towards the end of their life? And really looking at that, but also looking at this community that has buoyed him, buoyed his work, and going through that kind of, that solidarity movement. Um, and so this is what this story is about, is the Filipino-American community, but also leadership. So every, there's many, many leaders I see here who do come actively do community organizing, and I know all of you, I've seen you out on these streets for real, working it, who are organizing either in art, um, cultural power, community power, um, policy, politics. It's hard. And we tried to show that in this ecosystem of trying to create solid bonds with each other and solidarity, that we get lost. A lot of the times we get lost, but we need to be found and a lot of that times is looking inwards and figuring out what your history is. And so that is the story of movement. Thank you, thank you. We're gonna get into that in a hot second, but we do have another video that we'd like to show. Yeah. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. And it's just, it actually dawned on me that some people aren't familiar with what, what a workshop is. So what, what is a workshop? What is a traditional workshop? When you think about a traditional theatrical development process, right, um, there's pretty much a pretty standard formula to it. You write the thing, you get some actors to read the thing, um, and then in a workshop point of the process, you read the thing and maybe explore staging the thing. And you share the thing live and in person once. I think for us, a workshop means something really different, which I think I'm really excited about, right? And the great thing about our process is that because of the videography, we're able to share it with the community and with the world. We can get feedback right away from um, not only our actors and from all of us, but also from the folks that this story is about. So that's really exciting. Kind of like in this hybrid world. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's really helpful to have the cinematography because you would never really have that in a normal workshop. Never, right? never. And so it's almost like you fast forward to the end of the process, but now you have a mix. You can see some costumes. You can see how they sing. You can see some acting choices. You can see some blocking. It's really cool. It's, it's revolutionary. The name of the game here is scaling and leveling up, right? On all, on all fronts. Yeah. <laughs> Writing, staging, directing, and even for me, the challenge of bringing that to life in a cinematic way. And Workshop One was great because it was a cinematic way of presenting these songs, but this time around, we really, we really went for it. I think we're trying to introduce new elements this year. There's a lot of different motion that we're going through with camera moves and we're still keeping the documentary style and trying to really turn a light on the excellent work that this creative team is doing and, and elevating it in a way where the look and the feel of each song comes across. I'm very excited about that. So here we go.
job for 20 cents an hour together we come in thousands we have power unity is possible to fight these lies to prevail but finding honest leaders is like finding the holy grail ernesto and chris are honest leaders yeah but we need more carlos will us on road in the saturday evening post we want to share in the promises of american life it's fruits and promises <laughs> If you want to know what we are, we are marching. If you want to know what we are, we are marching. This isn't the road you think it is. Don't look back, I said no, don't look back. When you arrive at the season, you come marching. When you arrive with the season, you come marching. <laughs> 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 We're a network of stories and chismes. History with footnotes. It feels good to tell the truth. <gasps> hey, did you hear that two Filipinos were shot in Tascadero? For oh. throwing rocks at scab. They'll work in Brussels sprouts. Oh no. What's a uh, Brussels sprout? <laughs> it looks like lettuce, but tiny. <laughs> did you hear the girls were calling Filipinos bums? For striking. What was the strike for? We asked for 35 cents an hour. 35 cents? You can buy five pounds of sugar. I need more sugar for my suman. Don't be <laughs> all, honey. The young like us jump from boxcar to boxcar. We have nothing but the beauty of what we are. From 7,000 islands to this one, we collide and connect, speaking different dialects. Our humor strong, our resolve. Chris, that was beautifully shot. Thank you. So good, Chris. Thank you so much. Also, give it one more time for those amazing performers. Holy cow! Nikki, I don't have anything to add because the content that teed it up was basically the stuff I didn't want to spoil, but I do want to take a second, if I, if I may. Please. Just to, um, first of all, thank you, Cam, for allowing us to be here and um, share this very interesting hybrid project. It's equal parts musical theater, film, future documentary, like it's all these things as, as we develop as artists, we're just finding this new, this big, big story to tell. It's getting bigger every day. But I do want to say like, that's not possible without the crew that I work with. I do have any crew friends in, in, this, in this mix over here. Yeah, my guy Rick's right there, uh-huh. That is not at all possible without the hands that you don't see. Those performers were amazing, but man, the crew behind the film, like, like, we really, we really just put in some serious hours and some work. So I, I, I'm not the director or cinematographer I am without the crew. I just need to say that up front, so. Yeah. Creativity doesn't happen without community and collaboration. For sure, uh, Brian, did you? Uh, what, can I, uh, sorry, Brian, can I add one more thing too? The, the vocals that you hear there, those are, those are the vocals. Like, they're not lip syncing. 
they were performing that to a I mean, they were listening to the music of the ear, but that's what we pulled from, so that's the talent. I just want to say that as well. So, artists, amazing. Oh, they're amazing. And I think, um, I just wanted to share just quickly, musically, and you'll hear some songs later um, after this, but uh, musically, we're, it's like we're creating a whole new model. I'm creating a whole new model as a composer myself. I think what's been great about this process is that we're bringing ourselves into the work. Like, even musically, in the beginning, we were like, let's write music um, that's within the time period, right? We're gonna write 20s, stick to that genre, 30s, stick to that genre. But then when we talked it over and, and the, when we decided, like, let's just write what we know and what, what we're inspired by and what we grew up with. And I grew up with the 80s and 90s, you know, hip hop and, you know, OPM and ballads like Regine Velasquez and all that. And oh, we're like, yeah. we're like, once we, when we, once we decided, let's just do that and not stick it to, to, to strictly to the time period, I think it just like, all the songs started flowing for me uh, as a composer. So you'll hear that, even the three songs um, that we're gonna be performing uh, soon, but um, they're all different and we wanted to show the, the ballad, you know, that we all like love and we also want to show like there's like hip hop in there and, and um, uh, another song inspired by Sugar Pie DeSanto who's a San Francisco vocalist, you know, African American, Filipina and so we threw it all in there, it's like hollow hollow and I think <laughs> musically, writing, um, uh, cinematography, everything, producing, it's all like mix mix and that's what uh, I love about this project, process. Yes, mix it up. Um, we have a little bit more time to have conversation before we get to the musical portion of our evening. Um, I'm curious a little bit just to kind of dovetail and come back to, Gail, what you were sharing earlier about storytelling. Um, I'm curious about uh, Gail and Brian, what it was like for the two of you coming from, Gail, your, your book perspective, the, how, the book that you wrote with uh, Dr. Mabalon and Brian, like how you as a composer, as a storyteller, how you were able to make that partnership happen, because that was also a really special part of this project. I don't know if any of you remember the Bobby Banduria Band. Yes. <laughs> I know. We, we would play at dives all throughout uh, San Francisco, and I think all of those Bars are no longer here, um, but if you remember that some 20 odd years ago, um, I was the violinist for Bobby Banduria, and we were also, you know, just rocking and rolling over at Bindle Sif, like we said earlier. And so Brian and I had actually always wanted to collaborate, and he's classically trained. He's done, you know, he's. If you listen to some of the music that's been uh, that they play. Um, uh, traditional folk songs and folk tunes, Brian has actually rearranged them and they're playing. If you've ever gone to a performance anywhere to see a dance company perform uh, traditional um, Filipino dances, they're most likely playing Brian's arrangements, which is Ooh. wild, right? <laughs> So this is, I just want to give a shout out to Brian. We were at City Hall and I think it was the Filipino American History Month and the Parangal Dance Company was performing and he was like, oh my gosh, that's my arrangement. And I was like, oh, okay, Brian. Um, and so it was beautiful because I, I'm going to say this and I tell my kids this all the time. You don't have to be the best to put music, uh, to, put, to put work out. You just got to continually doing it. And that's how I feel being a violinist <laughs> and I just keep on playing no matter what and so he was very Brian was really gracious with me those first times I brought my violin and I was like dee, 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 dee. and then um, but I would write the music and we would try it out and he would take it and he would cut up the songs and um, he would cut up some of the lyrics and then we would put it back together again or we do rewrites um, from my perspective it was really one of writing initially I would try to sing I'm not you know, I tried to sing over some of the melodies that Brian did, but Brian's an amazing, amazing composer, and I'm very grateful that we finally collaborated and landed on this project. And so um, we would do it on Zoom. Most of, the, most of this work was absolutely done on Zoom, going back and forth for hours at a time. Oh, thanks, Gail. Um, I think, uh, that's so sweet. Um, no, I think when, we, when Gail mentioned before about having safe space, and Gail gives me that safe space. And to have a collaborator like that, you just got to hold on. Like, you're like, all right, let's go. Because, um, because what, working with Gail, what she taught me was that just get it down. Like, I think uh, 
for me as an, a composer, and really a first time composer of a full length musical, I was always, I had a lot of, have, have a lot of insecurities about like, oh my God, are people gonna like it? Is this even gonna be good? You know, is, is, and, and I think, and I know when I worked with, started working with Gail, it was like, just get it down, you know? And then we can just, you know, work and develop that. And that has been just, for me, just the most amazing. Um, thing about working with Gail and I think this whole crew, it's just like, let's just get it down on the page and then see what happens. Um, and uh, and we've been, <laughs> now we're like 20 songs in, right? Like we've been <laughs> yeah. 20 songs. Like 20 songs <laughs> worth of experimentation. <laughs> but, you know, we're going to keep continuing to, to develop it and evolve it as well. And so um, that's just really great. Again, having that safe space and Gail provides that safe space for me. Beautiful. Honestly, <laughs> ideal picture of a team of collaborators, am I right? Like, there's so much love. And even, listen, I just, circling up with these folks right before we got up on stage, it was just like, oh, I'm in, a, in the middle of a big hug. Oh, great, cool, I'm along for this ride. Um, I would love to uh, maybe go down the line and share like some favorite themes from Larry the Musical that you've, I already knew we're there as a part of the story and the history and like Larry Itleong as an icon of Filipino American history, but also things that you found along the way in developing this process, what you've seen, what has really come alive through the process of collaborating. That's a great question. Um, I mean, definitely food. I remember, I remember one of our first workshops, we were like, it was a Sunday and it was over Zoom and we were all cooking something. I think you were baking or something like that. Gail was, <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, and Gail was writing, I was frying something, I don't know what it was, but um, a lot of, of, of the things that we were familiar with is like infused in, in terms of like, just not just the music, but you know, what we grew up with, right? And so a lot of that uh, we can relate to, and it's like, it's real, you know? It's, it's something that we can, um, we can connect with. But for me, I think one of the things that I can take away from is that just that last song, uh, they're talking about all these cities, Stockton, Watsonville, um, we, I think Filipinos are even found in Alaska, right? It's just that we are everywhere, right? And, uh, you know, like we, when you, we would drive down to LA, you'd pass Delano and, and Stockton and all of these places, but you never really stop and actually see what Stockton or what these places are about, right? And I think after doing the Delano, um, the Delano workshop, it made me realize that, hey, Filipinos are everywhere. You know, and most of the time we're just passing right through them. Like we passed by um, uh, Larry's uh, um, plot, and it, it was unassuming. You would not know that it was there. You know what I mean? Millions of people would have probably driven by it and have not known that uh, a, a great leader is is laying in rest in there. You know what I mean? And so I think for me, it's making me um, making me want to slow down a little bit uh, in terms of of finding out what these you know what these places are about, especially what, what Filipinos have contributed to them. Because we've contributed a lot more than what we, what we think or what history has told us we have done. So mm -hmm. that's what I'll take from that. I don't know, I'll be quick. I think um, uh, building off of what we shared before when we befriended our Delano, friend, Delano, Delano folks and friends um, is, uh, is, for me, it's swagger. Like I always put swagger in all my music. I'm like, yeah, sing it with swagger, go. Um, and like just the joy and the resilience in, in, in our peeps. Like that's what I want to convey in the music that we're writing. And that is a, 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 big, a big theme is joy. Um, I think we've had such a very joyful experience um, working together, but then also our Delano family. Um, Nikki's here tonight from Delano, one of the families, and actually Dr. Don Mabalon had interviewed um, Nikki and her mother about their experiences as women, um, which we don't hear a lot of stories historically about the women um, during this time period of, of the Panais there. And, um, and so, uh, you know, and, and, and our family in Delano said, you know, we had a lot of joy it's not just the sadness, we were on strike, we didn't have any money, um, you know, or that, you know, not a lot of people had money, we were migrant farm workers, but you have to remember we were human. 
we hear these historical stories and we forget that we're human at the center of it and that we had joy, we had love, and we were always, always funny. Like Filipinos are always down to laugh and, um, and make fun of things. And they have that too. And we saw that camaraderie in that Delano family. So we saw it within ourselves. I just want to give a shout out to um, Dr. Don Mabalon. Um, the, the great historian, Dr. Dawn Mabalan. You can see her um, on Mission Street. She's on the Bayanihan Community Center. You can see her there. Um, she's also um, in front of uh, 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 Cultivate Labs' space for artists. Balai Creative, she's also there. She's the great and late historian that we unfortunately lost on the day that we finished Journey for Justice, The Life of Larry Itliong, that book. And so <clears throat> I am so grateful that she was able to uh, give us the history um, and to, she really, really, that was her life work in collecting all of this information and all of this history so that we can actually look back on it and read it and say, what? Larry Itliong was writing letters to Walter Mondale? Oh my gosh, there's a telegraph. Uh, there's, a, there, there's a telegram to um, uh, Bobby, Bobby Kennedy. Um, so we can really see the impact of Larry Itliong. I mean, I mean, the amount of research that she left. Thank you, Don. We could not have told this story without her, and she was always joyful, very funny family of farm workers from Stockton. We went to the same preschool um, in um, Filipino Center there in Stockton. And um, I just, the joy there and the joy and the memory of our ancestors and, and Dawn really passing off this story and Delano also passing off the story so that we can tell it and we can tell it together. Gail is a G, let me tell you, like historian G. Um, so two quick thoughts, like on the internal side of the work, I think I'd like to say that one thing I picked up is that the people who are doing this work, they're, they're about that life. We're about that life, you know? Like we know the hustle of the artists, we're about that hustle artist life. You've got the historian side of things. She's about that life, right? Um, Brian and Gail are doing insane community work here in San Francisco. They're about that life. And so like this piece is not, internally it's not just like, oh, that looks cool, let's do that. You know, that's, no, that's not what it is, right? So I think that's a big takeaway for me is that art um, is meaningful and matters when people are, are about that life, when they're about that content, it like hits, you know? Um, but theme-wise, the thing that, that really hits for me is this idea, you, you heard it in the song, the first lines, follow the ancestors, listen to their story. I think Filipinos are inherently spiritual people. So whether that means you're raised Catholic or you have some other type of, you know, spiritual upbringing, I think there's a very, there's, there's like this um, pull that we have to the spiritual world. And it wasn't until I got on this project where I really understood this idea of like listening to your ancestors, those people who've gone before. Um, whether or whether or not that's an audible voice that you hear, it's a presence thing, right? Like that's why we're talking about Dawn, we're talking about the people that went before, and we're realizing that they're, they are the, they are connect, we're connected still. Um, you even see it in like movies like Black Panther, you know, they're like, oh, they're an ancestor now, right? So like this like deep connectedness to that, that theme is something that has resonated with me and has kind of changed the trajectory of my personal life actually. So I, I think that's a big part of it. So thank you for that. Thank you all so, so much. Um, we have about five minutes left, and I would love to ask, um, so where can folks find out more about Larry the Musical? What is up next? Because this, this obviously is going somewhere. We're talking about it now. It's gotta go keep moving. Um, so where, where's it at? <laughs> so you can find more at Larry the Musical on Instagram and our Facebook at Larry the Musical. Um, so you can find all of that information there. And um, we also wanted to make the announcement today that while we had told everybody that we were going to do this show in October, we felt like we really needed three more months 
to work three, three more months. And so we will actually be showcasing and premiering at Brava Theater in March 2024. Yeah. So it's not. So, so if you want to see this, we will be premiering not in October. So we, everybody who's part of Filipino American History Month and is planning their activities already for their organizations, be like, woo, okay. <laughs> we no got a whole month. We are not doing Larry the Musical during FOM 2023. We are doing it through International Women's Month. Yeah. On March. And it really is kind of a, what do you call that, like a circle? Because we started during the pandemic in March. And we're going to show in March. Whoa. So it's kind of blowing my mind right now because I just figured that out. <laughs> right Thank now, you. right here. We started in March. Yeah. We figured it out. So we, I know, hey. So the ancestors got us. We were like, oh, no. The ancestors got us. They're like, we got you. You're supposed to do this in March, not in October. So, but we do have some other things planned in October. We do uh, to just keep the momentum going. We're gonna be doing some special, cool things in October, whether they be virtually, whether they be at Brava. So yeah, just, uh, just keep visiting our website, www.larry.themusical.com, and our Instagram and Facebook. But well, we'll be uh, posting all those uh, exciting things soon. And I know I see some folks out here. I know folks have sent in amazing video auditions. Thank you so much. Yes, so, <laughs> yes. So uh, you can still submit. <laughs> submissions are still open if you're interested. <laughs> we don't like the last one. I, submissions are still open, so we're so grateful that our community knows how to dance, they know how to sing, they know how to play instruments, they know how to work the camera, they know how to write. I mean, I don't even know. Like, everybody's like, oh, I mean, I, you walk into a room and I'm like, oh, I'm not going to sing because there's like about 11 people here who are opera singers. And um, so if you still want to submit and you feel that in you, we are still accepting submissions. And if you have already, we love them. We love you. Thank you for submitting. And we will be sent, uh, sending out more information for folks and through our newsletter also. As the musical continues to develop and grow as well, I think the needs of the film side are gonna grow as well. So if you're interested in the film aspect of this, um, you can reach out to me at Chris J. Sotelo. That's my IG. Um, I'm very active there. I'm not as active on Facebook, but send me a message and I'll message you back. Um, but yeah, I, I think that I don't know what this is. Like, it started as a, a, a you know, a different, like a, not a Zoom, let's make a different thing. But then now it's just becoming something big and I, I want to be able to document this properly. So if you're interested, you can find me, talk to me after. And I would take him up on it because he will build the cameras and I don't know if any of you know this, I'm sure you're, you filmmakers out there and, and, and for those who have handled the camera, it takes like 24 hours, maybe even longer for him to build a camera. So um, before we start filming, he actually starts it, putting it together for hours and hours and hours. So it's not like, oh, I have a camera. He's building a camera. So if you want to learn and you want to know, <laughs> this is a master right here. We won't even tell you what he does during his day job because he's the master there too. If you but want to be manual labor, <laughs> come see me. Beautiful, beautiful. Give it up one more time for our panel. <laughs> Awesome, thank you all so much for being in conversation with me today. There's more to come tonight with some very stellar musical performances. Um, and please visit their website, their IG, their Facebook. Find out how, if, if you are not an artist yourself, um, how else you can support the continuation of Larry the Musical into March. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you, Nikki. So folks, we are going to see three songs right now performed live, um, which is really exciting. And I will let Brian introduce our beautiful and amazing vocalists who've also been our muses, can I tell you? Um, and um, so the first one that you'll see is, uh, that you'll hear is a song about Delano cockfights. And so, we have a picture of, not the Delano cockfight, 
Um, but one of the greatest Filipino boxers in history, Pancho Villa. Villa. We weren't sure if folks would be open to seeing, you know, roosters in a cockfight, but we wanted to be respectful of that. So here we have Pancho Villa, one of our, the Filipino American community's greatest historical boxers. Um, and so uh, cockfighting has, a, has very much, <clears throat> excuse me, a place in Filipino American culture um, and the, in the Philippines. And while you see one of the greatest Filipino boxers here, this song is about cockfighting and the place and sport where many Filipinos, like boxing, took great pride in and is a cultural heavyweight of history and memory, especially to the farm working communities throughout the West Coast and especially the Central Valley of California. There's Pancho. Yes. So here we have, uh, so excited to introduce you to Mara Sotelo. <laughs> and Alex Rodriguez. Please give it up. So they were part of the first workshop, and actually Mara's been there from the very beginning, so I will be singing with them. Today. Yay! <laughs> So the next song is A Better Next Time. Uh, so we have a picture here of Larry It Leong. Um, this song speaks to the emotions of what Larry felt toward the end of his life after he resigned from the United Farm Workers. And um, yeah, this is actually one of the most recent songs we wrote for the last workshop. And we wrote it in about a week. And um, it, I was really inspired from the writings by Gail and Kevin Kamiya to just you know, convey this piece of conflict, but also kind of an awareness um, of his, uh, of just where he is in his life at this point. So um, we're really excited to share this with you. This is Better Next Time. You know, relationships are a lot like campaigns. You win some, you lose some, but every time you start, it all melts away. Won't play the same game. Think you're smarter and fiercer and wiser And you pray to God that no one gets betrayed And you hope it'll be better this time And I hold on to that hope And I pray it'd be better this time Be better, better this time you know that I've been beat down too Been disrespected and subjected To know-it-alls I never listened to But I held on to you You brought power to my truth And I devoted all my days to serving you And I prayed it'd be better this time Hold on to that hope. Oh, God, please be better 
ready to make real change. Can't you see I'm finally where I wanna be? Hey, you inspire me. I feel alive again. Ancestors, I will set you free. And then the final song we'll be singing is uh, Not Coming Home. And um, this song tells the story, and it's the beating heart for all activists and community workers. Um, we wanted to write a song that captured the emotions that so many Filipinos felt when they realized they were never going back to the homeland they left behind. While, while this song is about Larry making the decision not to go back home to his childhood sweetheart, it represents us all. So this song is not coming home. Thank you. First time that I don't have the words to say My promise to you was the first I've ever had to break But ever since I arrived my purpose has changed My heart is telling me I need to stay I'm sorry but I'm not coming home to your arms even after all you've done to keep our love alive so far away never in my wildest dreams we would be living our own lives we never wanted to break our hearts in two but this is what i have to do I'm sorry, but I'm not coming home. I hear your voice and I can see your face. It's been so hard, I thought about giving up. Every letter I read, I know that we're about to break. We're oceans apart, I feel you right there by my side. I can't love, no, I'm doing the same. Struggling to fight for change. I am fighting for us to take back the land. I am fighting for us to take back the land. Teach those around us so we can all understand. Teach those around us so we can all understand. Sweat of the pool. The hope for a better tomorrow can't be ignored. To your arms, even after all you've done, to keep our love alive so far away. But when I was on separate shores, love is more, it's bigger than. I want you in my arms, but there's no way Right here is where I need to stay I'm sorry, but I'm not coming home Home is not the same as you remember We thought that we could build our lives together Torn apart, we're called to do what's right, reach deep into our hearts and fight. We must fight. La 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 Sorry, but I'm not coming.
some language of the powerful and give us some choice I feel you right there by my side I'm sorry But I'm not coming Thank you all so much. Thank you to Mara Sotelo and Alex Rodriguez. And to all of you, thank you for your support. And we have a special gift for our own very own Gail Romasanta in honor of Mother's Day. Oh. Happy Mother's Day, Gail. And to all you mothers out there, thank you. And. Okay. Oh. oh, thank you. This is like the beauty pageant. <laughs> that I didn't know I wanted to win. Uh, this is beautiful and thank you everybody for being here um, and sharing your Sunday evening with us. I wanna say that there's also a beauty pageant song in Larry the Musical, so uh, in March you get to see the beauty pageant song which I absolutely love that I'm pretty sure Mara's gonna hit it out of the park there. She's amazing and wonderful in it when we showed it um, at our third workshop. Um, but I also wanted to say that this is very much the perspective of Filipino-American history um, and Filipino-American artists and musicians and cinematographers and producers um, and writers. Uh, we also really, really want to highlight also the healing that absolutely takes place when you are part of this story and you watch this story. I know a lot of Filipino Americans never even knew this history was here. Um, and it was assembly member who's now Attorney General Rob Bonta and Dolores Huerta who lobbied to recognize Larry Itliong at the state level and to recognize Filipino American farm workers and farm labor movement at the state level. So it is absolutely our gratitude that this, is ha this has been a unicorn. Uh, getting this story out there that absolutely took politicians, it took our community leaders, it took the solidarity of so many folks. And so at the end of today, um, at the end of this event, and into moving forward with the story and moving on with all of our days, I know all of you do community work. I'm pretty sure of it. You would not be here if you did not love community and if you were not part of the community in some way or form as an artist, a community worker, as an organizer, as um, even volunteer, uh, and as a leader, that solidarity happens. It continues and just like Better Next Time, that is the heart, the absolute the heart of community work is that it everything is always better next time and we strive for that and we strive for solidarity. So, si si puede, huelga, uh, it is all wrapped together in our movement and I hope that we can continue this, we can continue to heal our Filipino American community so that we embrace the story and we're not ashamed of being farm workers. We are not ashamed of our past. We are not ashamed of manual labor that is a badge of honor, which is what our Delano family told us and what my family didn't necessarily recognize growing up, but we recognize now that it is a badge of honor so that we lift ourselves and our stories out of shame and into the spotlight, getting candies and chocolates and flowers and having and creating solidarity that is absolutely necessary today. So I want to thank you that your being here is an act of solidarity to push forward our stories and your being at CAMFest is an act of solidarity. So I thank all of you. Thank you.